I'm Steven Spatz, Assistant Outreach Librarian, and on behalf of Library Director Joe Lucia and the staff of Falvey Memorial Library, I'd like to welcome you to the final event of the 2012-2013 Scholarship at Villanova Lecture Series, <coughs> this year's Endowed Chair Lecture. Each academic year, Falvey Memorial Library invites a Villanova professor who is the current holder of an endowed chairship to deliver a public lecture on their current research and recent publications. And this year, we feature Dr. Lauren Showett, the Lucko Family Endowed Chair and Professor of English at Villanova University. Dr. Showett's unique scholarship has earned her numerous fellowship and awards, fellowships and awards, and she has lectured and published widely in the areas of early modern drama and poetry, adaptation studies, genre studies, the historical and cultural impact of literary form, and the evolution and impact of literary format, which leads into the cutting edge area of digital humanities. While the strict definition of the term digital humanities remains open to question, there's little doubt that digital projects, such as the luminary editions of the works of Shakespeare for the iPad that Dr. Short will discuss with us this afternoon, represent an arresting shift in long-standing notions of format. And from a librarian's perspective, join the ranks of a never-ceasing parade of technological innovations that continue to confound traditionally simplistic notions of the boundaries of an item. Is the forthcoming luminary edition of the fellow that Dr. Schoed is directing a printed text, an audio recording, a video? Is it an adaptation, a commentary, a work of criticism? The short answer is that it's all these items rolled into one, as well as an array of extra textual study and online collaboration tools. A fellow's iPad, text, context, and digital humanities. Would you please join me in welcoming Lucko family Endowed Chair and Professor of English at Villanova University, Dr. Lauren Schoet. Thank you, Stephen, and thanks to all of you for coming. I'm, I'm short and I'm not good at technology, so I'm the perfect person to be doing the iPad stuff. My students think it's very funny that I publish on things like digital archives, but I can't, you know, turn on the projector. <laughs> so is my former chair. <laughs> Did Othello have an iPad? Of course not. Shakespeare's play Othello was first performed in the early 17th century, probably first around 1711 or possibly 1604. It was printed in quarto as a small independent play text in different versions in 1622 and 1630, and in a non-identical version in the larger folio, containing many, but not all plays, to which Shakespeare seems to have contributed in 1623. Quarto, 1622. Folio, 1623. Non-identical plays. Published, this tells us, the mouse is showing it right, yeah. According to the true original <coughs> copies, as is usually the case in early modernity, when someone says that, it's because it's not the case. There are no true or original copies. What copy of what? When we get to the works of William Shakespeare containing all his comedies, histories, and tragedies truly set forth according to their first original, as many of you know, there is no first original, does not contain all of the comedies, histories, or tragedies to which Shakespeare seems to have contributed. Several are missing, and it contains some uh, no, sorry, it contains some to which we know other playwrights contributed at least as much as Shakespeare. <coughs> Moreover, when we see the list here, we start not with the plays, but with the actors. These weren't types at all, and were best, rather they were performance pieces, and there are often some of them were best known by who played different parts. Instead of having true original copies, we have reconstructions, imaginations, fantasies of what's left, I changed the beginning of this talk a little bit based on what I saw in the case out there this morning. I don't know if when you came in you saw that from the Falvey collections, there's an uh, 18, the one that's out there is 1837 um, edition that is one of the most influential in making us think what we think about Shakespeare. I actually like the title page on that one better, so I wanted to give you this so you had a facsimile, but uh, this is what's out in the case there text that looks similar. It says, the plays of William Shakespeare, accurately printed from the text of the corrected copies left, sorry, this is just a typo of mine, by the late George Stevens and Edmund Malone, 
So from the text of the corrected copies, remember how these were true originals? But apparently the copies needed correction by George Stevens and Edmund Malone many generations after the plays. With Malone's various readings, what we have is not self-evident, doesn't speak to us without interpretation. Instead, we get our editor's opinions on them. A selection of explanatory and historical notes. If Shakespeare's so universal, is it not odd that we all need so many footnotes to make head or tail of what's going on? Um, a history of the stage. That is also my typo. I'm sorry, I did all this on my iPad, so maybe this tells us something. <laughs> and a life of Shakespeare by Alexander Chalmers, FSA. Othello may not have had an iPad, but the characteristics of the play text surrounding Shakespearean plays suggest that the play centrally and always inhabited, not a fixed form, but a series of remediations, moving from stage to page, <coughs> from one repertoire to another, from playhouse to playhouse, from manuscript to print, from print shop to reader, from play to novel to opera to film, back in and out of plays, users, actors, censors, and eventually to a canon that forgets all the problematic origins. Today I want to offer some observations and provocations that have arisen as I've thought about homologies and uses transferring back and forth from the play to its characters' journeys into other imaginative realms, novels about Iago, operas about Othello, um, to iPad editions of Shakespearean plays. I'll close this workshop today with a show and tell of an iPad edition, but not of Othello. The app's producers, always just about to be resolved negotiations with the publisher who holds copyright to a source text that was offered to the luminary directors by the text editors are still not finalized. When Hurricane Sandy postponed this, I thought, well, at least we'll be able to show the Othello. It's always a week away. Um, this, too, has intriguing homologies with questions of copyright, licensing, and use around early modern dramatic texts. So I hope we can take the lack of an Othello for the show, tell, and play portion of the afternoon as a provocation for further discussion. The show and tell will instead be based on The Tempest, a closely related product in one in which I served as one of the eight commentators, instead of the Othello for which I'm the content director. If my substitution leads us into a conversation about the frontier of intersecting publishing business, copyright law, and digital licensing, so much the better. Did Othello have an iPad? Of course not. But he did have a handkerchief. This handkerchief appears suddenly in the middle of Othello. Apparently, his wife Desdemona is in the habit of reserving it evermore about her, but we do not hear of this until Act 3, Scene 3. Thus, the handkerchief materializes from nothing in the exact center of the play. Once it appears, it is central to the play's action, to the plot hatched by the tragedy's vice figure Iago, to make Othello suspicious of his chaste wife, Desdemona. Othello apparently gave the embroidered handkerchief to Desdemona early in their relationship. After their marriage, Iago asked Amelia to procure it, then offers its loss to Othello as a sign of Desdemona's infidelity. Later in the play, at crucial moments, we hear two further backstories, not entirely compatible ones, for the token. Here is a famous satiric summary of the play and the handkerchief's part in it from the very end of the 17th century. This is from Thomas Reimer's Reflections, a Short View of Tragedy, which was published in 1693. Here's Reimer's summary of Othello. And, and I should say, there's a lot of different audiences here. A lot of these are really famous problems about Othello. Um, <coughs> and I am bracketing some really important and problematic things, which we can certainly go back to uh, when we're talking in question and answers. So Reimer's rather tendentious and somewhat racist version. Othello, a Blackamoor captain, by talking of his prowess and feats of war, makes Desdemona, a senator's daughter, to be in love with him and to be married to him without her parents' knowledge. And having preferred Cassio to be his lieutenant, a place which his ensign Iago sued for, Iago, in revenge, works the more into a jealousy that Cassio cuckolds him, which he effects by stealing and conveying a certain handkerchief, which had, at the wedding, been by the Moor presented to his bride. Hereupon, Othello and Iago plot the deaths of Desdemona and Cassio. Othello murders her, and soon after is convinced of her innocence. As 
And as he is about to be carried to prison in order to be punished for the murder, he kills himself. Whatever rubs or difficulty may stick on the bark, the moral of this fable is very instructive. Let's skip to the second one. This may be a warning to all good wives that they look well to their linen. <laughs> I've been thinking about the ways that the handkerchief and the iPad overlap in their operations. Both textile and technology pop into textual traditions in medias race, provoking re-readings of what went before at the same time that they become woven into new uses. They alternately reproduce, replace, and complement the page. They're even geometrically congruent and I think this might make for more than a facile similarity. They even both look like pages. Particularly interesting for me today are the ways they sponsor relays, forward-looking repurposings that are also retrospective rereadings. There's Othello and Iago. Not sure if the handkerchief is in this or not. Not sure exactly what Iago is holding or if the whole point is that there is nothing to be seen. Intertextual handoff, <coughs> Paula Fogel has a play from the mid 80s about the handkerchief. Both the iPad and the handkerchief sponsor some reuptakes at the same time they inhibit others. So let's think a bit about the handkerchief as a late arriver on the scene that is also a game changer, keeping in mind what this might suggest that we do and don't do with newly arrived digital technologies. The nonchalance of the handkerchief's appearance as an object of purportedly long-standing import is remarkable. Out of the blue, Amelia reports, I am glad I found this napkin. This was her first remembrance from the moor. My wayward husband hath a hundred times wooed me to steal it, but she, Desdemona, so loves the token, for he conjured her she should ever keep it, that she reserves it evermore about her to kiss and talk to. One of the things we won't talk about today is how precisely this corresponds to a fetish, for those of you who want to think more about Othello. Amelia blandly refers to Iago's hundred cajolments and Desdemona's perpetual hanky chat, declamations we seem to have missed. This triggers at least an impulse, I think, to rereading. Did we miss a page? Did theatrical spectators tune out during a scene? Whether reassured by researching the text or by dismissing the momentary terror that we've been obtuse, we revisit the action up to that point in the play, rereading it, more or less, literally, for verification, a position that is only perceptible by means of rereading. That is, whether from the moment of the handkerchief's appearance or from the end of the play, retrospection and proleption are required to perceive the middle as middle. Revisiting the dramatic past to find the handkerchief that wasn't there places us in Othello's position as he reevaluates his history with Desdemona. You see what I mean? We think, oh my gosh, I missed the handkerchief. Where'd it go? Just as Othello becomes convinced that his wife has been unfaithful because the handkerchief isn't there. The handkerchief triggers paranoid rereading, recasting what was read or watched by us, or what was lived by Othello, as we implant the back formation that can account for the instantaneously central handkerchief. Do you guys remember when Buffy the Vampire Slayer suddenly always had had a younger sister? It's a similar <laughs> sort of problem. Not only does the manner of the handkerchief's introduction catalyze recursive rereading, Amelia's characterizing the handkerchief as Desdemona's first remembrance from the moor ascribes such a structure to the object itself. Naming a token a remembrance alerts the object and the subject of memorial function. The gift aims to recall Othello to Desdemona when he is absent, while also, as a remembrance from the Moor, registering that Othello, wherever he may be, is remembering her. Remembrance is rereading. It imaginatively reassembles the parts that may be frayed if absence makes memory fade. First remembrance initiates a loop of reenacted revisitation that registers the operations of rereading. Recollection is necessary to constitute a first, and the initiation of a series is perceptible only retrospectively. Later, after Desdemona's death, Othello terms the handkerchief the recognizance and pledge of love. See the second to last line here. 
Recognizance is rooted more in the cerebral than the somatic basis of remembrance, cognition rather than member, being subjected to recall. But Othello's recognizance shares with Emilia's remembrance, first remembrance from the more, a retrospective and proleptive recursive semantic field. Recognition, with its clap of anagnorisis, is deeply of the moment, at the same time that its force comes from re-inscribing or reassembling the past moment of cognition. Super adding pledge, looking for my mouse again, there it is. Super adding pledge, future-oriented promise to the phrase amplifies rereading's constitutive backward-forward oscillation. Once the handkerchief materializes on the stage and the page, it's available for a wide variety of nonce reappropriations, like a story, like a form, like a genre, like a technology. The handkerchief apparently has been busily inhabiting several worlds of its own while the events of the play were developing in Venice and Cyprus. The handkerchief's exuberantly discontinuous appearances spotlight operations of rereading by making the seams among the readings so ragged. As abruptly as the handkerchief first appeared, Othello conjures it into a narrative of magical maternal inheritance. That handkerchief did an Egyptian to my mother give. Then, equally suddenly, the handkerchief becomes instead a token of patriarchal inheritance. Oops, sorry. Oh, okay, wait, I remember. Um, we're going to go back to those other slides in a minute. It was a handkerchief, an antique token my father gave my mother. That handkerchief did an Egyptian to my mother give. She was a charmer and could almost read the thoughts of people. She told her while she kept it, twould make her amiable and subdue my father entirely to her love. But if she lost it or made a gift of it, my father's eye should hold her loathed and his spirits should hunt after new fancies. She, dying, gave it me and bid me, when my fate would have me wife, to give it her. I did so, and take heed on't, make it a darling, like your precious eye, to lose it or give it away were such perdition as nothing else could not. Tis true, there's magic in the web of it, a sibyl that had numbered in the world the sun to course two hundred compasses, in her prophetic fury, sewed the work. The worms were hallowed that did breed the silk, and it was dyed in mummy, which the skillful conserved of maidens' hearts. Each rereading draws whole textual and generic traditions with it. The matrilineal bestowed magical handkerchief arrives from romance. Dennis Britton remarks that this handkerchief alludes to the fulfillment of the romance between Ariosto's Ruggiero and Bramante, <coughs> and intertextually signifies romance's ability to transform and incorporate a Muslim knight, the very romance narrative that establishes Othello's place within Christendom. The antique token, by contrast, plays out in the field of English patrilineal inheritance, a token of holiness that becomes a treacherous idol when multiple textual traditions are overlaid as Lawrence Warner discusses. Such rereading works palimpsestically, discontinuities among readings from different times or with different imports revealing the solidity of reading acts, the significance of each erase, preventing its full erasure even as they overlay. The durability of, uh, we're gonna skip that. The handkerchiefs resituations in different stories, different motivations, different genres, different modes, reread it, but only up to a point. The handkerchief status as a small material object, ontologically robust but easily transportable, suits it to the modes of circulation that constitute rereading. The handkerchief contrasts with the play's related textiles, the stage property wedding sheets on the one hand, and Iago's figurative flag on the other. The wedding sheets at the end of the play, upon which Othello strangles Desdemona, are too physically large to be strategically lost and found like the handkerchief, too semiotically fixed to the bedroom to be transported and displayed elsewhere on stage and in story. Accordingly, the sheets may serve as a synecdoche for one of the handkerchief stories, the story of Desdemona and Othello's wedding, but not for all the tales that are spun in and with the more agile handkerchief. Opposed to these unwieldy sheets, Iago's flag and sign of love, which is indeed but sign, is purely figurative, 
amenable to the radically free semiotic play that allows Iago so much power to craft meaning as he wishes. But where Iago's flag, his immaterial sign, is almost infinitely plastic, foundationally free from such reference points as truth or evidence, the handkerchief's physical robustness makes for a different semiotic scope, more firmly set within formal and lexical fields. Its meanings are not fixed in any of the fields of play, but it does operate within defined, if multiple <coughs> and multipliable discourses, courtly love, dynastic romance, exotic magic. If Iago's free-floating fabrications are writerly, the handkerchief's transactions are readerly. Previous critics have treated the handkerchief as fetish or talisman, exerting its own enigmatic will over the characters whom it draws into its own repetitive story. But we would do well to lean on story in this formulation rather than the handkerchief's will. Effects arise from meanings woven by receivers and, provo and propagators, not from the provocative object itself. Indeed, provocative etymologically acknowledges the voicing required for provocation to be realized. Not just reading the handkerchief, but rereading it in different contexts for different purposes and interests accounts for the multiplicity of stories told around the handkerchief. The abruptness of its appearance, its transitions, and Amelia suddenly vacating it from Othello's cuckoldry narrative with her exasperated, that handkerchief thou speaks on, I found by fortune all point to his larger circulation through many stories before and after and separated from Othello's stage. A fetish would be finished when the drama's done. The literary histories that weave the handkerchief live on. Whence did this handkerchief appear? The small textile is an apt metonymy for text, textuality, and intertextuality writ larger. The handkerchief appears in Shakespeare's most immediate sort, Cintio's Hecatomiti as a textile testifying to chaste female virtue, interwoven with figures. The handkerchief also recalls Philomela's tapestry, woven of threads of deep purple on a white background, depicting the crime of her rape at Terios's hands in Ovid. When Ovid in Ovid, when Terios forecloses verbal narration by cutting out Philomela's tongue, its stump throbs in her mouth while the tongue itself falls to the black earth trembling and murmuring. The tongue does not stop telling stories even as its signifiers change from words to movements and inarticulate sounds in a narrative of brutality. Philomela, for her part, moves to the different textile medium of her Thracian loom, and Ovid's readers reread Philomela's tale in her woven testimony. Othello's handkerchief draws in other textile texts as well. In its guise as magical, ancient, and exotic, handkerchief versions 3.0 and 3.1, in which it is inherited from Othello's mother and invoked to chide Desdemona for its loss. The handkerchief is cut from the cloth of Orlando Furioso's pavilion, provided by the enchantress Melissa, where Ruggiero and Bradamante are wed. Othello's handkerchief rereads this in its issuing from an Egyptian charmer who could almost read thoughts, and the magic in the web of it came at the hands of a sibyl. Sorry, yep, there we go. Also, in, from the Sybil story, come the distinctive temporal properties that associate the handkerchief with rereaderly practices. Othello's Sybil, as we have seen, had numbered in the world the sun to make 200 compasses in her prophetic fury, sewed the work, the worms were hallowed that did breed the silk, and it was dyed in mummy, which the skillful conserve of maiden's hearts. Rooted in the past through her superannuation, Looking ahead, in prophetic fury, the Sibyl sows stories of futurity. Multiplying temporal affiliations, she uses a medium imbued with the dye of ancient fluid made from the hearts of young maidens. Maidens always trope futurity. These dead maidens are frozen in their present, but dead maidens also always summon, for those of us who look at them, thoughts of the future that was foreclosed. The pavilion in Ariosto's Orlando weaves parallel multiplicities of time as it rereads time worn tales. 2,000 years before, the costly tent had been embroidered by a Trojan maid. Prophetic powers to the gods had lent. She, with her needle, a fair story made. The noblest, the most gallant cavalier of all who from her brother's stock would spring, she had depicted. 
The 2,000-year-old tent was embroidered with images of descendants not yet living for Cassandra, long dead by the time of the protagonist here, Ruggiero. Not only does the Orlando here ekphrastically reread Cassandra's tale, it also explicitly and comparatively invokes other readings of the matter of Troy. Uh, I don't have a slide for this, but what ensued was infinitely worse than ever was described in history, says Sue. As Cassandra's tapestry proleptically traces the tense 2,000 year journey through literary history, all its intertexts emerge into the interpretive horizon of the Orlando, positioning the romance and its reader for rereading. Othello appropriates the magic embroidery, not the whole tent. Instead, the handkerchief rereads two different elements of the Orlando, taking the prophetic embroidery from the tent, the motif of the incriminating talisman out of place that drives a lover mad, from the bracelet that Orlando gives Angelica. Hybridizing the stories marks the borrowing as dynamic rereading. Rereading is precisely the origin of the handkerchief's magic adding a magical elements from Ariosto to the handkerchief taken from Cintio <laughs> uses Ariosto to imbue Ari Othello's handkerchief with the association of enchantment. The embroidery on Othello's handkerchief, the text on the text, demands at least as much rereading as its fabric. Its embroidered strawberries make it identifiable, but those strawberries, in Susan Fry's words, clearly mark the divergent ways of reading the handkerchief. In the multiplicity and self-contradiction of what they signify, strawberries could by themselves constitute a perfectly adequate lecture on semiotics. Early modern strawberries signify utterly saturated contradictories. Chastity and fertility, celibacy and love, voluptuousness and maidenhood, deceit and holiness. More to the point of our present interest in rereading, the strawberries mark the mutual exclusiveness of different versions of the handkerchief. The ancient Egyptian Sybil is unlikely to have embroidered English strawberries. Does anyone know if they have strawberries in Egypt? I don't think they're part of the textile tradition, whether or not they actually have strawberries. The disharmonious multiple versions of the handkerchief's embroidery provoke rereading, as we both struggle to synthesize an account and are pressed to acknowledge, through the version's non-coincidence, the multiplicity of stories that adaptive rereadings produce. The play terms the handkerchief's embroidery work. Amelia cites this work in the handkerchief's first appearance. The Sibyl, in her prophetic fury, sewed the work. Othello delusionally casts it as Desdemona's exchange for Cassio's imagined amorous works. The ambiguity of Amelia's work at the moment she fatefully takes the handkerchief gives us a closing sense of rereading. Amelia proposes, I'll have the work taken out. These words could refer to removing the distinctive embroidery or as makes more sense in dramatic context, and as editors tell us they can mean, to have the pattern copied, right? The exact opposite of taking it out, to make another one of it onto another textile. But this never transpires. Bianca refuses. I'll take out no work on it. The handkerchief is not reproduced or rewritten, but only reread. I'm ready to switch to the iPad. Rereading is central to what the iPad app sponsors. And what we at Luminary Shakespeare Project have tried to do is find ways to make new readers equally welcome, equally fluid, and equally ready to take on one another's roles. So what we're trying to do with this iPad app is give you the simultaneous benefits of a fresh new book, and a book that lots of other people have put sticky, sticky notes into, and a chance to put in your own sticky notes, both literal and metaphorical, um, as well as options that either let you get rid of those when you come back to it 10 years later, or let you keep them and see what was I thinking when I was whatever age I was before. Should I get this out of the way? Can I unplug that? Yeah. Okay. So for this Tempest, what we did is we used a uh, good enough open source text and edited it. The reason we haven't done that, although we, we might with the Othello, wait, help, do something. <laughs> <laughs> Can I put up the stand, though, because otherwise I can't type on it? Okay. Why is it advertising that? 
go away. Uh, thank you. Done. How's that? Why is I closed everything? Okay. So let me show you a few things on the Tempest, and then um, I don't know if you know people want to come up and mess with it, and we can ask questions about it or what. Whoops, how to use. Um, this is a bunch of the features that you'll see that we have. We have the text, and like with a paper edition, there'll be little glosses where something weird or complicated is happening. You can touch the hand and get a gloss, but if you don't want it, you, don't, you can also make them go back away, which is one thing that you can't always do with a paper text. Well, we'll be back at that, but sure, okay. Um, my point is just all of these little fingers, and I'm always fascinated by the use of fingers. Have you guys, uh, Peter Stallybress has been writing about how, how much reading is a manual technology and how when you have bad arthritis, it's harder than when you're blind. You can get books on tape, but if you can't hold the paperback and stick your fingers in, I guess you're happy with the arrival of the Kindle. So the index finger, Think about how an index as a finding aid comes from that pointing, the finger that points. These manicules, they're called in early modern textual practice, show a place where there is a note. If you wish to touch one, it will give you a reading. But you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, there's audio available that you can turn off or on, so you can listen or watch it <coughs> at any point. Mm -hmm. um, I hold it and I hit audio. <coughs> Why are we not hearing it like we did this morning? Possibly. Let me turn up my volume. Let's see what that does. It thinks it's, those are headphones, not speaker, maybe? We did test it, everybody. Okay, I'll go on with other things, we'll come back to this. Um, so that you can listen to it, is it paused, maybe? Maybe the volume on the line out, down below there. That looks like a port, something important. I'll show you My brother, whereon a treacherous army levied one midnight, fated to the purpose, did Antonio open the gates of Milan, and in the dead of darkness, the ministers for the purpose hurried thence, me, and I... But you don't have to listen to it. <laughs> um, one feature we have that's been really fun is um, there's ten places in the play that have audio plus. I'm just looking for an audio plus icon. That is the sheet I just left on my desk was where I had these slots marked, which is where we can ask the actors to read it uh, two different ways. So you can play director for a moment. Um, I'll wait till one naturally comes up and then I'll hit it when we're in the middle of something else. Um, sorry about how to use. Um, you can copy, highlight, oh, I'm sorry, like I said, how to use. You can copy or highlight. You can put in sticky notes and your own paths, um, which are two things that are pretty interesting. You can put a path through the play, which can you can use as a study guide. You can export it to Facebook if you want to talk to other people about it. Um, one thing that's handy is you can, here's two things that I especially like. If you're an actor, Um, I'm sorry, now I've got myself flustered. Okay, first of all, there's searching. So I can, let's say I want to look at everything that has to do with song. I can skip right up to that. This on the left will tell me where I am, and up here it will always give me a line number. This is very handy in the classroom, that when you say turn to 3, 2, 22, you just type in the numbers and everybody's there. I can also change that and I can say, sing, and I get all of these. You see how when you want to pull together something, um, you can then try singing. Um, another thing that we have here are comments 
by a bunch of different um, scholars, actors, and high school teachers. So that you can, um, and you can either search for all commentary by one person, or you can happily go along until, let me get us to act four. Four, four, one. Whoops, you have to be able to type. Four, dot, four, dot, one. Um, these tell us that there's a comment where you'll get a more extended remark by someone. This will pull up the whole thread by one person, or you can instead search by line. Sometimes more than one critic will have commented on a line. And what we're trying to do here is um, make for a rich playing field for people with more and less and different kinds of experiences of the play. With the sticky note feature, any reader can make their own comments for their own group, whoever that might be. Um, another thing that we have is for actors, you can search by role. Um, bookmarks work the way that you would think they would. Um, content was well, three. Audio, audio plus we discussed. Lectures might have roles. Um, so if you're playing Caliban, for example, you can have everything on it. You can turn the cues off or on, so you can get the two lines before you or not. Um, yeah, <coughs> actors like this. Um, so let me show you another example. Uh, where do we get to the mask? I don't remember, so I'm going to go. Here we go. I can get right to the mask. Okay. Um, I think we should hear it. So I'll take us back to... Um, that's my commentary, and hold that, ask for audio. Or else good night your vow. I warn you, sir, the wet cold virgin snow upon my heart abates the ardor of my liver. Well, now come, my Ariel, bring a corollary rather than want a spirit, appear and pertly. No tongue, all eyes. Be silent. Uh, I'm looking now for an audio plus for you so you can see. Uh, there's a terrific one with Ariel, uh, first read by a man and then by a woman. like to come up and drive this a little bit or shall we start with questions and then people can mess around in the background let me just find I'm sorry as I said this is the thing that I forgot my post-it note on of a good place there really are lots of them I just seem right this minute not to be able to find a single one so what we're looking for is a little one of these um, guys with a hat there we go all right so now we can to cram these words into my ears against the stomach of my sense would I'd never married my daughter there for coming thence, my son is lost, and in my rage, she too, who is so far from Italy removed, I ne'er again shall see her. Oh, thou mine heir of Naples and of Milan, what strange fish hath made his meal on thee? Then we can hear the alternative. I ne'er again shall see her. Oh. Thou mine heir of Naples and of Milan, what strange fish hath made his meal on thee? Sir, he may live. I saw him beat the surges under him and ride upon their backs. He trod the water, whose enmity he flung aside and breasted the surge most swollen that met him. So this is where I was planning to uh, open this up to questions and remarks about the project, about the larger issues of iPads, about 
the notion of rereading and the handkerchief. And people are also welcome to come up and mess around with the iPad app. I think something in your talk was setting that up. I looked up and found out that Egypt is listed as one of the five top strawberry producing countries in the world. <laughs> Glad to know it. Okay. <laughs> What's really interesting about the handkerchief is just as, as a piece of needlework, um, this is a primary way that women practice literacy in early modernity. Um, there's been some really interesting thinking about samplers as one of the main ways that 16th century women, um, not noble women who were highly literate in writing poetry and translating Latin, would interact with letters and with words and with materials. And strawberries are one of the main things that they embroider. But strawberries have, as I said, this completely saturated but utterly contradictory iconic value. Lauren, could you talk a little more about the difficulties in terms of copyright? And <laughs> just curious. Um, uh, it is really interesting. Sadly, I'm not quite the right person to talk about this for two reasons. I can say a couple of things. I mean, there's really interesting things about the questions of ownership, and this is where this why do Anglo-Americans think they own Shakespeare, right? That it's our heritage. Why do Americans think that Shakespeare is more ours than <coughs> Galdos? I mean, of any ethnicity, there, there's a whole question about Anglophone heritage. Um, and then the question, what's fascinating to me, but I'm way on the outside of it, so I don't have anything smart to say about it, is how invested publishers are right now. They're just, the people that we're dealing with right this minute, the reason I can't talk about it much is we're, we're in the middle of these negotiations. And also, it's not me personally who's doing it, because I'm just a content director. But my understanding is that there are some people, um, like the director of licensing, who will be really excited. Um, the Folger Library has, after some stalling and confusion, really embraced digitization. I was just working with them on a project. They put this massive database of early modern drama, little known stuff. I mean, do you ever think about what a tiny fraction of what's, a tiny fraction of what was performed was written down. A tiny fraction of what was written survives. A tiny fraction of what survives is available in a modern edition. The Folger has digitized zillions of early modern plays and they've decided to make it open source so that 18 year old college students can easily pull up and say, you know, I wanna see all the plays I can about foxes and go look at them. Um, and what they're experimenting with, building on some work that's been done at Northwestern is crowdsourcing the editing. Running the get editing almost like a game um, so that you can get all kinds of people, retirees often like doing it, students like doing it, start training people by having them do it and you give them points and things, and um, status and credit. And people get really interested in digging into the problems that used to be something you didn't do till you had advanced training in codicology and paleography. So plunging people into things that really matter. What if you have two different texts with two different versions? You know, being able to ask first year students. How many of you guys are first year? A bunch of you. Um, how would you decide? It's not this magic thing that some editor who's smarter than you said, it's wise, not wife, in The Tempest. There's a famous crux. In fact, I'll pull that one up for you. Look at this. I want to show you this famous crux. And I don't know off the top of my head where it is. So I go to wife. Um, and then I remember uh, it's a thing about paradise. Uh, but we use the other one, so it must be wise. There we go. So in act one, scene four, Ferdinand, who's the son-in-law, I will get back to your question one second, Charlie. So Ferdinand, who is the son-in-law, line 123, let's get some audio here. Uh, so rare a wandered father and okay, a wife let's, let's just back makes up. this okay. place paradise. Sweet okay. note. Hush, back up, Ferdinand. Okay. Um, so Ferdinand, uh, I need to say, go back to 120. And now let's hear the audio. Oh, to think these spirits. Spirits which by mine art I have from their confines called to enact my present fancy. Let me live here ever so rare a wandered father and a wife makes this place paradise. Sweet Did you hear what he just said? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what happened here, I think, is that the actors from the London stage, were, this is a famous crux. Um, the actors from the London stage were using one which made sense to 18th century editors, right? 
a great father-in-law and a great life, wife, that sounds good. If you just say that what the text here says, so great a fa wondered father and a wise, like who needs a girl, right? I'm just happy being here alone with you. Um, and you happen to have here a commentary where I've explained the crux. Um, some of them read wife, some of them read wise. It seems to have been due to a simple thing where the lead letter broke, but then you've got traditions of both. So you get these different ideological readings of whether Ferdinand cares about marrying Miranda or whether he just wants a relationship with his father-in-law. Um, so back to the question about um, the larger issues on licensing, you'll get dealing with one single publishing house, one department will be really excited about the opportunities for 18-year-olds to do the kind of editing that we've done and looking at the wife-wise, and others really um, are concerned about changing the business model. So that's why that keeps dragging on. Um, this is a small detail, but I noticed in the folio and the listing of actors that they didn't seem to be arranged in any particular order. Do you, by any chance, know like why they listed that? Uh, right. The idea, that's a great question. Um, you can learn fascinating things by looking at modes of ordering and organization, and the library people here know fascinating things about the history of cataloging um, and finding aids. and. Alphabetical order, for example, is generally um, first used in the 16th century, late 16th century, early 17th century. If you look at indices, I find about half the stuff is by hierarchy. You get critics that say, you wouldn't want to be alphabetical because that would put, um, every example now I'm thinking of is wrong. What I was trying to say is, they, they make arguments like, you can't put son before father, or you can't put human, all of those are in the right order in the alphabet, but help me, you know, you can imagine the argument. And then the other half of them are alphabetical, but they only bother to alphabetize by the first letter. So what you learn is there's just really different senses of what would count as organization, and um, lists like that are often on the random-ish side, although the first people who occur to you in those actor lists are usually the most famous actors who are usually the, the clowns who are doing improvisation. How do you, uh, in the Othello, I don't know much about Tempest, but in the Othello edition there are, there are significant differences between the Porto and the Yes, there are. So how do you code with that? In the iPad. Um, I'll know more. What's, right now, um, the luminary directors, who is someone from Bryn Mawr and someone from Notre Dame, but not me, um, are negotiating with two different publishers because they're using um, texts that have already been annotated. So depending on which of those two they end up going with, the answer to that will differ. Um, in this, you will see, whoops, I'm sorry, about textual note. This one, Jesse Lander, who's not the person I was just referring to, um, gives a head note like you'd find in a book about the status of the different things. And then when it's interesting to people we imagine using the play, there will be notes like what I just had in the wise wife thing. Are there texts that are better suited to this kind of digital interaction than others? Like, is there a reason that you chose Othello over another play? Oh, um, when we chose, they wanted to launch four right away and four more afterwards. And with the delay, we now have eight ready to go. And we wanted to start with the ones that seem most taught and most read by book groups because we wanted people to get excited about it. Where I would really like to see this go is opera. There's not very good things if you want to be able to look at a score at the same time that you're listening, at the same time you're looking at a libretto. Um, I hope that will happen. Um, iTunes, is that right? What's the difference between iTunes and the Apple Store? I say to my kid, make something appear here. I think it's iTunes. It's iTunes. It's iTunes. Thank you. I think it has an Apple Store. In fact, you can go buy it now. Other questions or comments? Does anyone want to complain? And in order to be able to teach with it, you have to have an iPad and all your students have to have an iPad. Okay. And can you write a note? You said you can do sticky notes? Yes. I'm <laughs> really bad at it. Hang on. Yes, you can. And there's two sense? different kinds. You can do one that's just for you, or you can do one that's for your discussion group. Um, and is anyone here from my senior seminar or my graduate seminar? My students actually did it. It's just the kind of thing I'm terrible at. Um, this is, wait, that's a live path. Okay, so here you can make yourself a path where you put in, like, criminality you got started on, and um, then it will pull up all your bookmarks that are on criminality. But what, what I was trying to do, good, there we go, is notes. 
So I had a note at this spot that it would be interesting if I wanted to look at relationship of visibility and power. So you can drop in notes, and as I say, there's these two statuses, one that's just for you, or one that gets exported to a Facebook group. So let me ask you a provocative question about doing it on the iPad as a locked-in commercial device versus doing it in HTML5 and making it an open resource. Yes, and people keep asking about cross-platform compatibility. And so is it because of the costs to produce it in terms of licensing and development that mean that you have to monetize it through the locked-in device as opposed to putting it out on an open platform? Is that the key driver there? I was not the person who made this decision, but my understanding is that it's about back-end um, up ongoing maintenance and alteration. The Notre Dame people wrote the platform because they're going to support it forever as things change. I think they weren't entirely happy with the monetization thing because the Apple takes a pretty big cut when they distribute it. Um, okay, so when I'm using this, yeah. I'm on wireless and I'm actually getting live feeds of content. I'm not actually using all the down like all downloaded content? Because why would the back end matter once it's on my machine? Because device? there's updates. And I think it is live because I'm subject to operator error, but when I'm places where I don't have a good signal, there's features I can't use. Okay, that's what, that's what I would Yes, there's a, right, so that like when you hit commentary, it asks if you want to update. Like, see, update all. I just clicked. I bet something bad happens now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's, that's interesting. I can talk to you about Derrida in the archive. I just can't actually use my iPad. So, so, so why, just can I follow up on that? So yes. why? Did Notre Dame's kind of maintenance of it require a single company to be given all the rights to this? And are, are they given the rights? I thought we were working through them. Um, the plan is that if it proves popular, to then expand. What's the, the tablets? Yeah. What's the DOS equivalent? Surface. Um, it's another word. Maybe it's just that I'm out of date. There was There's another. Kindle thing. Fire as well. Android. Oh, Android. Okay, Android. Um, right. So, I mean, I think it's all part of a development thing they want to see, see what happens with. But that was the idea. And we're, we've been talking about Paradise Lost. And as I say, I've suggested Opera. Sorry, everyone's interested in the parts I don't know about. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, here at Villanova, we're working on an app for the Confessions. It's a great idea. And we're using the Tempest as our way in. Right. And part of the reason for the, um, the update is that we don't want to have to produce everything for shot. We right. want to be able to put out there the things that next fall will be used by students and be able to, to build as time goes forward. Yeah. So I think the, the ability to update is just a, very helpful also for the developers. I think so, because with this, for example, we, we went online sort of slowly. We had a couple of commentaries, and then we got other ones in. And it's going to be really different with the next eight, only because we've had this delay. So it's kind of piling up. But I think that's another reason to use an app rather, if you're thinking about what can an app do for me, what can a book do for me, this is infinitely updatable until the apocalypse. But, you know, <laughs> so long as we have power and stuff. Um, and that could be kind of exciting because I, I at least am interested in the way that this intersects with lifelong use questions. Um, what you use in your ACS seminar and then what you want to use in your book group when you're 35 and then what you want to use when you're teaching high school after a career change, being able to revisit the way you were thinking about it, but then also there'll be lots of new knowledge you want to be able to keep updating. I don't mean to hover. Anyone who wants to comply with this should. I can answer questions from over here. Can you talk with this? A bit, because right now there's only The Tempest. Um, and what has been terrific is the post-its and Facebook conversations that have happened, mm -hmm. which is not in some ways that, it's a little bit different from using like a Blackboard journal or other kinds of blogs because it's key to places in the text. Um, so people are actually looking it up more. And it's great for getting to the right spot in class. The two things I had not expected to be so, the two, that's the, one of the features I like the best. It cuts down an enormous amount of rustling around. Oh, wait, I'm based in the Cordo. I don't have that act. Um, the other thing that's been surprisingly good for with the Tempest is the scholarly use. Just okay. when you search and you immediately get that box with the four places it talks about coral, and all you have to do is click on it, that's a lot faster 
than even other ways of using e-text to help you search and get to stuff. Well, where do these, this list of critics come from? Are these people associated with the project itself, or is it through the MLA, or? It's through the content, the content directors. So for me, it's Othello. I think of eight people who I think would be interesting in consultation with the directors. And what we've really tried to do here is be small-c Catholic. So on here, for those of you who aren't Shakespearean, um, you know, you've got people who are cutting edge digital humanities. You've got people who are extraordinarily old. Um, you have young Brits. You have, you know, the, Walt, the William Canan Professor of English at Harvard. You have uh, Peter Holland, you know, who's the god of performance and everything. Alex has done us a um, non-English language commentary, which we're hoping to have more of. This woman is an actress. Jessie's younger than I am. Um, Ellen Mackay is young and in theater studies. Um, the Folger Masterclass is high school teachers, and then also some others of us contributed things we've used in college, um, yeah, on teaching, teaching stuff. Um, Joe Roach from Yale is more drama oriented. Oh, and he doesn't get a bio? No, he does, there we go. Um, so my point is, Michael Whitmore is the director of the Folger, does data capture and digital stuff. So we're trying to be, um, give a really wide range, and you can load as many or as few of these as you want. So you can decide who you don't want in your ear. And is it new content that they've, new criticism that they've developed specifically to work with this app, or do you exactly. can link out to their previous scholarship? And that we call a bookshelf, and that is also linked on the scholarly bookshelf. What we're trying to do on this actual app, at least for now, you know, it's evolving, is you've got these skinny borders. So what's been really hard for me. Um, sorry, it's immodest to keep doing my own. There's one by someone else. Um, it's really hard to get people to write for skinny borders, mm -hmm. but we're, we're trying to make it also really approachable, not condescending for sophisticated users, but approachable for ACS users, maybe even high school users. Um, so we tr that's a way in which we're trying to take ideas from current professional conversation and put them in um, open and approachable terms and then there will be the links to the bookshelf. And that also gets us around having, we can't cite, there's no way to stick footnotes in those skinny little borders. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, is it designed to be extensible to um, shared reader input? So in other words, that you could build a community around the text and then you could link communities of, let's say you're teaching here and someone's teaching yes. three more and you can do this kind of. They're actually doing that. Okay. And that's what the sticky notes are working for. Um, yeah, it works really nicely because you just you link your Facebook groups and then you can do, we've done some theater projects where you'll get people playing the same role at three different institutions, um, talking to each other, complaining about their directors mostly, um, that kind of thing. Yeah. And is that safe? Is that like somewhere in an archive where you could go back to it and retrieve it and build that cumulatively? You can time? build those, that sticky note th thread, my path, into your personal downloaded copy and it will be there forever. But it, is it dependent on the persistence of the Facebook groups if it's done through Facebook? I don't think once it's been linked together, I think it gets pasted in, but that's a more technical question than I'm absolutely sure about. As you see, I can hardly post a sticky note. <laughs> Shall we um, invite anyone who wants to come get their fingers on it to do that, and anybody who would like to get home to do that? Thank you so much.